You know what? The only way you know what's really in fruit is when it's squeezed. You don't know how juicy an orange is or how sweet it is just because it looks pretty. There's a lot of Christians that look pretty. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But you squeeze them and see what you get. Eight ways to resist the devil. The devil is alive and well on the planet, so don't shrink back from hearing teaching about the devil. If you don't know that he's there, it's much easier for him to deceive you. If you don't know the truth of God's word, the devil can lie to you and you'll never even know that he's lying to you. John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief, the devil, comes only for one purpose, to steal, to kill, to destroy. One purpose only. But Jesus said, I came. Aren't you glad he came? Yeah. Every time I read that scripture, when I, came, when I come to the I came part, I just have to stop. It's like, I came. It's like when he came, he interrupted that whole mess. I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. I set before you life and death, God said, good and evil. Choose life that you and your descendants may live. Every choice that you make for God affects everybody in your bloodline. Every choice that we make not for God also affects everybody in our bloodline. We have authority over the devil. He has power but we have power and authority according to Luke 10, 19. There is a difference. Luke 10, 19, behold, I give you power and authority over all the power the enemy possesses. He has power but no authority unless we give it to him. And one of the ways we give him our authority is through inactivity and passivity because we don't even recognize that he is our real problem. Now, the number one place, the first line of defense for the enemy is always to attack our minds. He comes against your thoughts. He can, he can put thoughts in our mind. That's why the Bible says if we want to live in the good plan of God, that we have to completely renew our mind, change our whole way of thinking according to the Word of God. That's Romans 12 too. God's got a good plan for your life. He got a good plan for my life, but I spent a lot of years even going to church on a regular basis. I love God. You know, you can love God and still not know anything. Isn't that terrible? Or you can, you can love God and, and be in the process of still being taught things that aren't accurate. That's why you always have to Study for yourself and read for yourself and not just take somebody else's opinion of what they think. And so, the first thing that we do is get our minds renewed by the Word of God. Now, that means, and I'll just tell you straight out, if you're not going to study, you're never going to be victorious. Now, maybe I don't need to tell you guys that because you took time from work to come and be here today, so obviously you kind of already know that. But I'm not just talking to the people in this room. I have the privilege of also talking to people all around the world, and so... I'm just telling you that I'm grateful that you watch my program, but that's still not enough. I'm glad that you go to church on Sunday morning. I hope you do, but that's still not enough. Uh, maybe you go to midweek service. That's still not enough. And you think, well, how much do I have to do? You need to get to know God for yourself. Don't have secondhand faith through somebody else. I want to make sure you heard what I said. Don't be satisfied with a secondhand faith. It's not good enough to know somebody who knows God. You need to know God. Having a mama that knows God is not good enough. Having a preacher that knows God is not good enough. We need to know God. I love what Paul prayed in Ephesians for the church at Ephesus. Three distinct things beginning in verse 17. It's in chapter 1. He said, I pray that you would know God, have revelation and insight into knowing God and understanding him. Second thing in verse 18, that you would 
know and understand the hope of your calling and what your inheritance is among the saints that you, so he's saying that you would know who you are in Christ. And the third thing, that you would know the power that is available to those of you who believe. So know God, know who you are, know that you have the power to not let the devil rule your life and walk all over you and be active and not passive. Amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, are premier scriptures that teach us some things that we need to know about defeating the devil. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. Now, let me just say that if our weapons are not physical weapons, then they must be spiritual weapons. So the weapons that we have are not clubs and guns and knives and swords. You can't go after the devil with that. We go after him in a completely different way. For example, normally you would think that if you've got a mean enemy, the best thing to do is go beat him up. But if you really want to defeat the enemy, the best way you defeat the devil is go love somebody else. We'll get there. That's okay. For the weapons of our warfare, everybody say, I have weapons. And say, I'm in a war. <laughs> the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. Now, these strongholds you're going to see in the next verse are in our minds. Inasmuch as we refute arguments, theories, reasonings, and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we lead every thought and purpose away captive unto the obedience of Christ the Messiah. I don't know how many thoughts we have every day, but I've already had, I don't know, a bunch this morning. And... You know, thankfully, because I've been at this a long time, my mind's been renewed and not. I, you know, probably 98% of my thoughts this morning have been okay, but boy, I caught a couple of stupid ones. <laughs> I mean, while I'm putting on my makeup this morning, I had to say out loud, I rebuke you, Satan. That is a lie. <laughs> You're like, well, I would feel funny doing that. Well, would you rather feel funny or would you rather be destroyed? Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so, and obviously, you don't even have to always speak out loud. I do it because I just, I don't think he can read my mind, and so I want to make sure he has, that he knows what I say. God can read my mind, but the devil can't. And so, I'm not going to listen to his nonsense, but how many years did I listen because I didn't know any better? So, he said, we have to know enough of the Word of God, come on now, to recognize immediately every lie from Satan that comes floating into our brains, and then we need to know the Word well enough to then tear down that stronghold with the Word of God. So God has given us, I, I taught a message earlier this year about poisons and antidotes, and how if you get bit by a certain kind of snake, there will be a certain antidote for that. If you get bitten by a spider, there will be a certain antidote for that. And so when you've been poisoned, the thing that you always want to do is quickly get somewhere where they know the right antidote for different poisons. Well, God has got an antidote in here for every poison that Satan tries to afflict us with. Amen? For example, when he poisons you with bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, offense, there's an antidote called forgiveness. And so that's another whole message, but it's just, I mean, my gosh. And, and don't, don't give me that I can't understand the word thing. That just, you know, there's too many translations of the Bible for us to say that now. And I mean, there's study Bibles. I mean, my amplified study Bible called the Everyday Life Bible. I mean, you can understand it. It's full of 
if you can't understand what you read, it's full of explanations about what you read. I mean, it's a big dude. You're going to have to get a muscle to carry it, but it's... Uh, and if it's not the one you want to carry around with you all the time, it's great to use at home. I, I use it all the time at home. I would carry it up here, but I've already got a wrist problem from doing this for so many years. Yeah, I have... What do I call it? Bibleitis? <laughs> Something. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's from all the years I've stood up here and done this. So let me ask you a question. I want you to be honest with yourself. You don't have to answer me out loud. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. Do you know the Word of God well enough that you quickly recognize the lies of Satan and you know enough Scripture to come right back at him? Now, let's... Good, you're being honest. Okay, so... That's great if you do. So if you don't, thank God you can keep getting educated and every day you make progress. The path of the righteous goes brighter and brighter every day. Amen? Every day when you get out of bed and put your feet on the floor, the enemy needs to be afraid of what you're going to learn that day and the progress that you're going to make. And if you are one of the ones that said, yes, I know enough Scripture to do that, and you're not doing it, then that's just passivity, which we all can kind of fall off into that. So I just want to say going into this that number one way to defeat the devil, to resist the devil, is to know the Word and recognize the attacks that come against your mind and cast down those thoughts. In Ephesians 6, it talks about our armor, and one of those pieces of armor is the helmet of salvation and that literally means think like somebody that is born again. Don't think like a heathen. Don't think like an unbeliever. Think like someone that is full of God and born again. Number two way to resist the devil, stay in peace at all times. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Peace is power. I mean, it just undoes the devil when he throws his very best at you and you just trust God and remain peaceful. Now, I know that that's not always easy to do. We think about when Jesus got into the boat, a story recorded in Mark chapter 4 with the disciples, and the first thing he said was, let us go over to the other side. Now, when God says something, he means it. And what he says will happen, but there may be a few storms during the trip. And the Bible says immediately a storm of hurricane proportions, not a little storm, an unexpected, bad, big storm, right after Jesus said, let us go to the other side, right after they started their journey. Come on, is anybody with me this morning? Yes. Immediately after the good news came the attack. And... The disciples became afraid, and they got frantic, and Jesus took a nap. <laughs> In other words, they weren't hearing from God. They weren't feeling God's presence. They couldn't find him. They didn't know where he was at. He was hiding from them. Come on. Anybody there today? <laughs> oh, God, I just don't like to stay away. You're, out. <laughs> You're not saying anything to me. You're not doing anything. I've felt your presence in a long time. And all God wants you to do is zip it. and just stay peaceful. And here's, I highly recommend this. I do this all the time when I don't feel anything. God is working. God is working. When I pray for people that are fighting illness in their body, I pray for them on a regular basis, but then during the day, if I think about them, I will just say, thank you, God, that your healing power is working in sowing so. Thank you, God, that you're working in my children. Thank you, God, that you're working. Thank you that you're working. Just because we don't feel anything doesn't mean God's not doing anything. And I love that story in Mark chapter 4 that ends up in Mark chapter 5, verse 1. And Jesus, they woke him up, and he got up, rebuked the storm, rebuked them for being fearful, and then it says, and they arrived on the other side. And I like that. So here's the thing. He said, we're going to the other side. Here came a storm. He took a nap. 
they had a miserable trip and they did arrive on the other side anyway. So you can either travel through life with God frantic, <laughs> which is what I did a lot of the time, and old Dave, he just enjoyed life and was peaceful and I would get upset with him because he wasn't getting upset with me. Come on, if you're one of those more like upset people, uh, how, many, how many ladies do we have here that are kind of like I am and you're married to somebody like Dave? And I know, I know, you look at him and you go, what is your problem? How can you just act like nothing's happening? Why don't you do something? Come on, I would say, and Dave would say to me, what do you want me to do? We pray, we believe, we give our tithes and offerings. God's always taking care of us. He'll take care of this. Why don't you just cast your care? <laughs> well, you know what? Now I've learned how to do that. But it took me a lot of years. And I'm, tr I'm just trying to say that while we're making the journey, we can either decide to enjoy the journey or we can just let God drag us through while we're miserable. <laughs> I'd rather walk with God than get drugged through. Amen. Romans 16, 20, I love this. It says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will crush him under your feet. Ephesians 6, 15, one of the pieces of armor, and put on your shoes of peace. The words put on that we find very often in the Bible means take action and do this on purpose. Make sure that you... It talks about shoes of peace because we walk in shoes. As you walk through the day, as you walk through life, as you walk through relationships, always walk through in peace. And let's not use the excuse, well, I just can't help it if I get upset. I, you know, until we learn that we can do a lot about a lot of things that we don't do anything about, we never will. Let me tell you something. I can throw a fit with the best of people. <laughs> How many of you could do, you can... You're like an expert in fits, okay? Well, let me ask you a question. If you were having this major fit, ranting and raving at your kids, and ranting and raving at your husband, and saying all kinds of negative things, and I rang your doorbell, how fast would you stop and straighten up? <laughs> come on, come on, come on. So say, I can control myself if I want to. Ooh, didn't that feel good? Let's try it again. I can control myself if I want to. Amen. All right. Psalm 94, 12 and 13. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man whom you discipline and instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law that you may give him power to keep himself calm in the days of adversity until the inevitable pit of corruption is dug for the wicked. Don't you love that? Let's look at this again. That you may, uh, blessed, happy, fortunate be envied is the man whom you discipline. So it means God keeps disciplining us and he, he keeps chastising us and chastisement is always an act of God's love. And so he doesn't let us get by with bad behavior without dealing with us because he wants us to come to the place where Satan can't rattle us with every little thing that comes along. You're blessed when you go through these teachings with God. Verse 13, that you, that you, may, that you may give him power. God says that I may give you power to keep himself calm in the days of adversity. We might as well say, while God is digging a pit for the enemy. Amen. That's why it's important to say, okay, I feel like having a screaming fit. But I can control myself and that's not what I'm going to do because in the deepest part of me, I believe that God is working and God will deal with this because he is faithful and he has promised to take care of me. Amen.
Can I tell you something today? And I hope that this is, you'll just take this as God speaking through me. God will always take care of you. Did you hear me? God will always take care of you. He may not do it exactly the way you would like him to or when you would like him to. That's when we trust God that his ways are above our ways and that our times are always in his hands. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 4, 10, and 11 tell us to strive to enter, to strive zealously to enter the rest of God. So it's like he's saying, if you're going to work at anything, work at staying in rest. If you're going to really try to do anything, try to stay peaceful. And you know, I spent a lifetime not being peaceful, and when I decided I was going to have peace, I had to change a lot of things. Here's the thing. You have to make a decision to be peaceful. You can't wait for your circumstances to get peaceful. It's not about my circumstances. And I screamed at the devil and screamed, I rebuke you, I rebuke you, I resist you, I rebuke you. Every time I had a problem, and I still kept the problems. And I didn't realize that resisting the devil, <laughs> oh, I hope you're ready for this. This is, this is what the Lord said to me. Resisting the devil is not getting rid, all, get, getting rid of all your problems. It's you not acting like the devil while you got the problems. <laughs> Come on. It's for us to show the traits of God, the fruit of the Spirit, which is in us, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, meekness. And you know what? The only way you know what fruit is really, what's really in fruit is when it's squeezed. You don't know how juicy an orange is or how sweet it is just because it looks pretty. There's a lot of Christians that look pretty. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But you squeeze them and see what you get. Amen? And I'll tell you what, I could... Talk the talk and jump and shout as good as anybody in church. Man, I was in leadership. I had a seat on the front row. And my name on a parking place in the parking lot. I mean, I had it happening. But, oh, honey, you didn't want to squeeze my fruit. <laughs> anybody? <laughs> It's really not the way we act in church that makes one bit of difference. It's what goes on at home behind closed doors. So I had to change a lot of things in order to learn to have peace. A lot of them were things with people. I had to learn not to have to have the last word. I had to learn that I didn't have to always talk back. I had to learn that I had to always be right. I had to learn that I needed to keep my nose out of other people's business. <laughs> Practical stuff. <laughs> And the Bible talks about all of them, by the way. Did you know that one of the most powerful weapons against the devil, and perhaps the most overlooked, is love? That's right, love is spiritual warfare. And once you activate it in every area of your life, the devil really begins to lose his power over you. Zitten wereldwijd vast. It's a hostile territory, prison. And I'm speaking proof of that. Zij die achter zulke muren leven zijn mensen, en Jezus vraagt ons om naar hen om te kijken. I'm here for third degree burglary. I have a lengthy sentence of 400 months. The judge looked at me and said, "I'm going to sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life plus 20 years behind these prison walls." A lot of people don't have family here. So they feel forgotten. There's not a lot of people 
beating the door down to get in here to see us. That outreach of the hand to touch their lives in a personal way, to, to come visit them, to, to see that somebody is really thinking about them, that somebody cares for them on the outside. You're giving to people that really are like at the bottom of the totem pole. And with your giving, that, uh, that's actually bringing somebody up. It's the fact that you thought about us, even if it was just to come by and have prayer. We just feel loved, you know, that we're not pieces of garbage, you know, um, thrown away, um, that somebody does value us still, and that there is hope, there's hope for us. Tot nu toe hebben we meer dan 3600 gevangenissen bezocht. Zijn er meer dan 3 miljoen cadeautasjes uitgedeeld. En meer dan 139.000 gevangenen hebben voor hun leven met Jezus gekozen. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl partner. It's very painful and difficult to go through life with a wounded soul. I know because for years I lived that way due to being sexually abused by my father when I was a young child. But I learned that God could heal even my deepest hurts if I would just open my heart up and let him in. And in my new book called Healing the Soul of a Woman, you too can discover how to allow God into those wounded places in your life. God has a brand new beginning for you and you do not have to spend the rest of your life hurting. Bestel nu Innerlijke Genezing van de Vrouw via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Bestel ook het werkboek bij het boek. Joyce koppelt gerelateerde bijbelteksten en de diepgaande vragen aan de specifieke hoofdstukken die je kunnen helpen de innerlijke genezing te ontvangen waarna je verlangt. Vragen? Bel ons op. Wij zijn er voor je. Telefoonnummer 026 20 22 100.